So the wings on the back of the Anunnaki that you see depicted carved into stone all over the world, literally, you can find them in, in Mexico, in Ecuador, in South America. You can find those same carvings in Iraq. And uh, so we know that these beings are global beings. They were part of an, a global civilization. It, it was a, the, the Atlantean people. And they had, when you see them with the wings on their back, a lot of the times you'll also see them with a bird face. The bird face was not their real face because we clearly see them as well with human heads. So we know, or humanoid heads, I should say. They weren't human, but they had humanoid heads. Uh, and so we know that the wings depicted flight, the capability of flight. The, uh, the tablets themselves referenced the fact that they would put these eagles' masks on when they would travel into space. So they had the capability of space travel and the eagles' mask would be used in one particular tablet. They go to Mars, I'm sorry, not to Mars, I'm sorry, they go to the moon. And on the moon, uh, they had to put their eagles' mask on before they stepped out of the ship because the atmosphere was thin. This is, this is an ancient tablets. These tablets are like 8,000 years old. And they're talking about putting eagle some masks on because the 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 uh, the atmosphere is too thin. This is crazy stuff. But I mean, what better way to convey your message than to put it in stone so it can last through the test of time? And so the wings, though, depicted their ability for flight. And so I'm doing a whole series on the wings and how they flew, and some of the depictions that are talked about in the ancient stone tablets of what they what people witnessed as they flew. It's going to be pretty incredible. So that's coming very, very soon. Where are the Anunnaki and why haven't they returned? Good question. Part answer to that is some of them never left. When you look into some of the tablets, there was a, a war, that last pyramid war, which you can find evidence of that last war at Mohenjo-Daro in the Indus Valley, where you can see uh, the bodies of people still holding hands dead in the street and their background radiation is higher than background radiation level should be. So that means that uh, they were nuked. And the buildings that they lived in are still there, partially standing, but the, 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 brick, the, the mud bricks have been turned into glass. So they've been vitrified. Vitrification typically happens when you hit around 3000 degree temperature blasts. And so the entire region was vitrified. So was the Giza Plateau. The, one of the biggest reasons for that big, you know, the fact that the Nile doesn't run right up to the pyramids anymore and it's all sand and desert is vitrification. If you put your hand in the sands at Giza, you can begin to pull up balls of glass in certain areas, which will, uh, which lets you know that there was a war there that extended to that region as well. And all around that region, you can begin to find places where there seems to be some type of weapon signature that have left vitrified uh, building buildings behind, as well as, um, you know, remnants of ancient cities that look like they were destroyed. And so, uh, during this situation in the tablet, some of these beings said they were going to forego and they were going to leave and they left and some of them stayed. So I do believe that in some weird way, they're still around us today because I believe their offspring are still here walking amongst us and you wouldn't be able to detect them or differentiate them from a normal person at this point. And then the other answer is the ones that did go, when will they return? They always claim to, to, you know, to be coming back or we will return. We're coming back at some point in the, in the, in the distant future. For us, it's a, it seems like a long period of time that they've been gone. But for these beings who live for eons, they've only been gone for a little while. It's like they just went around the corner to the corner store and they're coming back. So it's going to be pretty interesting. Now, in the animal tablets of Thoth, some of the oldest texts on the earth, 36,000 year old texts, both the Atlantean says that far in the future, an enemy will come from deep space. And he says that the person that is wise enough to raise his ship from underneath the Sphinx will be able to defeat them with ease. So according to him, far in the future, in some deep future time, there is gonna be some type of situation we might face in space. Maybe it's the Anunnaki returning to take claim for this planet. I don't know, that's a good question. Trina Red, did the Anunnaki make us or tamper with our genetics? Great question. So this is what happened. The Anunnaki didn't make human beings. We were already here, but it wasn't human. It wasn't Homo sapiens sapiens. It was our cousins. We had cousins here. Okay. Our cousins were hominids, upright bipedal bilateral hominids uh, that looked very similar to us. Their bones have been found all over the world, even though they claim they can't find the missing link. These bones look just like us, except their heads and skulls are much bigger. 
bigger jaws. These people were, were massive. They had bigger brains. They may have been more intelligent than us spiritually. Probably had larger pineal glands. And then at some point, the Anunnaki, who were mining, according to them, not according to me, mining this planet for resources, creating a breakaway civilization for themselves, and doing a lot of hard labor, were getting ready to go to war against each other because one faction didn't want to keep doing all the work. And they were like, well, how come we're working like slaves, so on forth and so on. So what they did was they came to an agreement. This is in the Epic of Atrahasis, by the way. If you read the Epic of Atrahasis, they came to an agreement that they could take the existing hominid on this planet, see existing already here, and they could genetically modify it by adding their essence to it. That's a genetic modification and get it to do the labor for them. So they didn't make people from scratch. They genetically modified a cousin of ours, a deep, deep and an antiquity cousin and created from there homo sapien sapien. And how did they do it? Isis, uh, you know, fame, world famous Isis from, from, you know, you know, her all about from the Egyptian text. She said, you know, this, this process of cloning the, uh, the, the, the beings is, is taking too long and tedious. They need to replicate for themselves. So she took one of these hominid cousins of ours, took the egg out of the womb, cleared out some of the genetic material, added their essence or genetic material, created a zygote basically in modern terms, as we call it a zygote now, inserted it into her womb and took the baby to term for 10 months. And then there's a famous cylinder scroll with this whole story. She's holding the baby up after 10 months. She says, my hands have made it. The Adamu, which means first man, Adamu. That's where Adam comes from in the modern day Bible, the name Adamu, which means first man. And so there, there began the first Homo sapien sapien, the more advanced version of a Homo sapien that can actually go out and re reproduce by having sex with its mate. And then they can have offspring and so forth and so on. And they weren't the first and they weren't the only Homo sapiens that were uh, done in this way or born in this way. There were dozens and dozens because they understood that you had to have a diverse genetic pool or gene pool to be able to continue to build a population without having birth defects and genetic deformities. Anybody who's still walking around this planet that believes that two people populated the earth, they got to be out of their doggone minds. They got to be, whoo hoo, bye bye, they're gone. Okay, because. <laughs> Anybody who knows anything about basic genetics, two people can't populate a planet. We were we wouldn't have gotten this far because after the second or third generation, everybody would have been mentally ill, deformed, birth defected, and everything else. We wouldn't have made it. We'd had all kind of strange tumors and all kind of stuff, right? So that's uh, that story is fa is false. The, tr the truth is in the Sumerian tablets, you see that they had created this Eden, E D I N, and in this Eden they had already put hundreds of homo sapiens and sapiens in there and they would have them mate at specific times of the day. It was like, it was like a farm. And like you see, you have the horses in, in the farm and in the barns, you bring the, the male horse out to mate with the female horses and on these set times and dates and everything else to ensure that they get pregnant so they can breed more, uh, you know, more horses so they can race them and sell them for this and that. Well, that's the same thing they were doing with human beings. Okay, it was a breeding farm at the Eden, which was a, a, a like an outdoor laboratory, basically with guards. It had guards. It had guards in the Bible version, and it had guards at the gates in the Sumerian version. And these guards will kill you if you get out of line uh, in both places, in the Bible and in the Sumerian tablets. They will kill you. So it's pretty interesting that they had to have guards there to protect this breeding area where they had the people. And so they tamper with our genetics. This is where we get the, the book of Genesis, Genesis, Gen Isis, generations of Isis, generations of Isis, Genesis. The book of Genesis is the generations of Isis. And now you know why. All right. Thanks, Trina. Good question. By Compendium of the Emerald Tablets by Billy Carson.